Hey John, what's up, man? Thanks for thanks for your time. It's good to see you. Likewise, Jake. How are you? I'm good, man. It's uh, as you know, it's a cool full circle because you know, four years ago I read first Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and then I read Psycho Navigation and and The World as You Dream It, and the rest of them, and that led me on my own journey, and now it's brought in full circle and so I'm stoked to to be here and ask you some some questions great great I'm ready to hear the questions and yeah it sounds like some very fascinating things have been going on for you you've been scoring big time it seems like yeah yeah well you know I I just been I just been just like you said I remember when I heard you speak in Pasadena and you said you know the one way we're gonna create change is everyone has to find their passions and follow those talents and I just have kept sticking with that so I appreciate it man great great yeah so you know my first question is basically how do you think things have changed since you wrote confessions of an economic hitman you know do you think that the IMF and central governments are have greater control? Do you think it's lessened? Do you think it's the same? And 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 what do you think about that? Um, well, I think you know. I, I think things are changing big time. I think consciousness has really changed around the world. You know, where I've been traveling. Traveling around a lot recently, seem to be getting it. You know that that people are understanding that we're all facing huge crises. That we live on a very tiny space station, and we can't get off this one. Maybe a few of us, maybe there'll be a few astronauts, but most of us can't get off. We don't want to get off. You know, and and for the first time in human history, we're all able to communicate with each other across the planet. People are skyping, you know, texting, facebooking, everywhere. Everybody's getting it. So consciousness is definitely changing. There's no no question about that. At the same time, the corporatocracy is digging in stronger because they realize that they're being threatened. So we've got the NSA acting up. We've got all these new draconian laws. We've got the police states all over the world springing up. I was just on Skype an hour ago with a group of students in Switzerland. You know, they're very concerned about what's going on in Europe. So, so you've got these two things happening. People are waking up. People are getting it, wanting to demand change, and at the same time, the corporatocracy is digging in to keep the status quo. So how does an ordinary citizen, or, or really especially a young person today, if you were 22 like me, what would you do or what would you tell yourself at 22 that you could do right now to begin instigating change, to, to, to transcend the, or transgress the control of, of this corporatocracy? Right. I think the most important thing is to recognize that, that, that there is no, there are no ordinary people. We've all got a lot of power. You've got a lot of power. So you, you follow your heart. What is it you want to do? What do you do best? Is it writing? Is it making films? What is it that you really feel like you do best? Cool, man. No, answer, answer that. What, what do you? Oh, think? you're asking me. Oh, I, what I love to do is is ask pointed questions to individuals that have inspired me. I like to write and I like to speak. So I remember you saying that exact thing when I heard you speak, and that was it. And I'm doing that exact thing. Right. So that's it, and that's what you want to tell everybody else. And they don't all want to speak or write. Some of them are carpenters. Some of them are plumbers. But uh, you know, whatever they do, whatever they you know, it's it, we can all spread the word. We're all teachers. Every day we teach people, we're, we're talking to people, we're communicating. You know, let's not worry about who won Monday Night Football. Let's instead worry about, you know, who's winning the, who's winning the planet, you know. And, uh, we've got to speak out. And, and, and so just, you know, everybody that you meet, tell them, follow their passion. Do what they want to do. If they want to be a banker, okay, but speak out as a banker. If you want to be a doctor, okay. If you're a lawyer, if you're a house husband or a housewife, you know, but... We all are teachers all the time, constantly. So just encourage everybody to spread this word that, that there's a consciousness revolution going on. We got to keep it going. We got to get those corporations to understand that they need to serve us, the people, the 99%, not the 1%. So do you think, speaking, uh, speaking of, of helping these corporations become aware of this and, and better serving we, the people, do you think that? What do you think about the state of democracy today, and do you think there has to be a total overhaul of the system, or do you think that there can be minor tweaks into the current systems? You know, what's your thoughts on voting? Do you vote? 
Well, there's, we don't have a democracy in the United States today. There's no question. We don't even have a representative democracy. We don't have a republic. We used to have a representative democracy during most of my lifetime, I think, where our elected officials wrote the laws. They don't like write the laws anymore. Our, our, the, the corporate lobbyists write the important laws and run them through elected officials whom they own. So under a republic or under a representative democracy, we vote in people who then vote for the laws. Under true democracy, everybody votes for the laws. We're obviously not that. But we're supposedly a republic where we vote in people who write the laws, but that doesn't happen anymore. We vote in people, but they don't write the laws for us. They write the laws for corporations because the corporations pay for their campaigns. So we absolutely do not have a democracy today in our government. And I think it's important, though, for us to understand that the marketplace is a democracy, that the corporations are calling the shots, uh, and yet they are totally dependent on us. You know, They're totally dependent on our shopping habits, on us supporting them, and they do listen to us. So if we send enough emails and tell Nike, hey, I like your products, but pay, your, pay those people, those slaves who work for you, stop, stop having slaves, pay people a decent wage in Indonesia or wherever, they will get the message. If, if we say, we're not buying from you, we're not buying from you, Monsanto, we're not buying from you, Exxon, come on, you know, and, and we've got to mean it. We've got to stop buying from them, and we've got to send them emails. We've got to let them know. Because I do believe the marketplace is a democracy if we will only use it as such. We, haven't, we have at times. We get rid of apartheid in South Africa by boycotting companies. We get companies to clean up polluted rivers. Years ago, we got them to open their doors wider to women and minorities. Now we got to ratchet it up a notch and say, hey, your whole goal has to be to create a better world for our, us and our children and our grandchildren. We have to move from a death economy to a life economy. We have to move into an economy that's no longer based on war and ripping up and ravaging the planet, but rather one that's based on healing the planet, on cleaning up pollution, on, on helping starving people feed themselves, on creating new forms of transportation and communications, energy, banking, everything, edu you know, health care, everything. We've got to change the system. We've, we've got to build up a new system. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, have a, I had a few questions off of what you said, and the first thing to go back to the beginning was, you know, you're talking about how we used to have a republic, and I could be wrong, but to my, to my understanding, a republic is when, a uh, democracy is when the individual loses their sovereignty to majority rule, and a republic is where they still maintain their sovereignty, even amongst uh, a majority um, uh, consensus. What do you think has to happen on a political level? I, I, that's a, that's a, interesting point about that a free market is still a democracy but what do you think has to happen on a political level do you think that when we start making shifts on the market then naturally the uh then naturally congress and politicians that will naturally shift because then these mega corporations that are funding all these uh all these special interests and campaigns will then no longer have as much power because people won't be supporting them as much well, yeah, first of all, I think the move to amend is very important. We've got to get a constitutional amendment that takes corporations out of the political process so they okay. can no longer finance. But it's not just corporations. It's wealthy individuals. It's, it's got to, you know, the, the spending on campaigns has to be limited. And I don't know that that's ever going to really happen until we convince corporations that it's in their best interest to make that happen. So it's kind of a catch-22. I, I think why I say the marketplace is a democracy, because in my definition, a democracy is actually, in a, in a true democracy, everybody votes on everything, on every major issue. Everybody votes. Uh, Greece was like that, apparently, you know, ancient Greece, where everybody voted. In a representative democracy, which sometimes is called a republic, it, it, we vote, we, we elect representatives oh, okay. to vote for us on, on all the issues, on, on the laws. And that's how the United States was set up. That's how the, the founding fathers did not trust the majority of the people to be able to be educated enough to vote. So they said, hey, we're going to let the people vote on who, who can vote, basically, right. who, on who can make the laws. Um, but even that's not working anymore. Uh, it's because now our representatives don't give a shit no. about, about their, you know, their, the people who vote, vote them into office. Once they're in office, all they care about is the people who are going to finance their next campaign. And they know that if they get the proper financing, 
they'll win if they don't get the pro if they don't get the proper financing they don't stand a chance so do you think then that what has to happen is there needs to be do you think what has to happen it ha that funding has to come from the majority of the population in order for uh, elections and campaigns and we have to take out all that major funding uh, these immediate solutions that we have to how do we get to these immediate solutions like that well first of all I think going back to the other I think the, so the marketplace actually is a true democracy where we all do vote anybody who shops is voting yeah that makes sense and I think that's a great point and and but we also but we, but we have to actually cast a ballot it's not enough just not to buy from chevron or nike we have to say we have to send an email to chevron saying hey you know you you were found guilty you 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 lost a lawsuit for 18 billion dollars against ecuador you're refusing to pay we're not buying from chevron until you pay up and you clean up that terribly polluted rainforest and we need to send emails to nike and say hey we love your products but we're not buying them until you pay your your workers a fair living wage. So it's not enough. It's not it's not enough just not to buy from bad companies and buy from good ones. We have to let the bad ones know why we're not buying from them and the good ones to know why we are and encourage them. You know, let's tell Nike, hey, we're really happy that you you took oil out of your glues and replaced it with water based glues, but you're still using slaves. Come on, guys. Right. You know? And 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 so it's really important that we send these messages out. That so it's the, the the voting process in this particular democracy is twofold. It's how we actually shop, and also how we and well, we have to look, let them know. We actually have to cast a ballot and tell them how we're shopping. Yeah, that would be interesting to to get some major major professional athletes behind something like that as well. That are you know uh, these faces of of these companies too. Something else that you mentioned was about uh, health care. And, and so what's your thoughts on the Affordable uh, Health Care Act in um, the U.S.? And what, what do you think about it? Well, we obviously need a, a, a real universal health care. I mean, that's what we really need is where everybody has health care, like so many of the other countries in the world do have much better programs than we do. Many European countries, Canada, we all know the, the, the list. We need something like that. Uh, it's it's uh, it's unfortunate. I think that it, it appears that Obamacare has been a, a, a catastrophe. You yeah, know, it's, right. it's not just the internet. It's that people were told that they could keep their old insurance policies and it wouldn't cost anymore, and that doesn't seem to be happening. I'm not sure what's behind all that, but it it doesn't appear to be a a very good system, and yet. That shouldn't discourage us from saying that what we really need is universal health care. We need, we need that badly. It's, it's, out, it's outrageous to have the wealthiest country in the history of the world uh, have so many people running around that don't have any legitimate health care. No, and it's a huge burden on all the rest of us because when they do get sick or they are in emergencies, hospitals take care of them and then we, the taxpayer, pays for it and we pay a lot more than we would if, if everybody had insurance. So you spend a lot of time. Something you know that I, I really appreciate with you is that you do you do spend a lot of time with with young people at colleges and and things like that. And what do you see as? Do you think that tuition? Do you think how do you think that tuition in colleges and stuff like that needs to be set up? Well, it's ridiculous, you know, to pay <laughs> so much and. You know, it's it's a it's it's just part of the system that kids come out of college, kids, adults come out, young adults come out of college with all this debt. So you know, somebody goes to business school or or law school because they want to really do good work and change the world, make a better world. But they find they got all this debt, and they can't do it. They have they they end up having to, they feel that they end up they have to go to work for a corporation. But they say, hell, you know, I'll, I'll work for this corporation for five years and then I'll pay off my debt. But what happens is they go to work and then they fall in love and they get married and they want to have kids and they need a house. So they take on more debt. So at the end of the five years, they've not only not paid off their college debt, they've taken on more debt. And these, the corporatocracy knows this. So it's, it's a system. It's, it's, it's like the yeah. debt that imposed on third world countries when I was an economic hitman. It's the same system that's keeping, you know, young people... Uh, their nose to the grindstone. They're making them pawns of, of industry. We, we we get out of that. You know, when I'm speaking at colleges, when this question comes up, I I tell students, listen, you all ought to organize 
if, if across the nation you all organize and refuse to pay your debt. <laughs> That's a good one, John. <laughs> we'll get that one going. Yeah, do it. Do it, Jake. It'll work. <laughs> I mean, if you can, you know, if you can convince 100,000 students with big debt not to pay it, something will happen. I'm going to make a, a really nice, that's a great idea, I'm going to make a really nice produced video and get it really high quality and see what we could do with it. That's a really awesome idea, John, and see if we can get some people to post that around. That's great. I think a lot of people might do that because you would just need enough people to where they wouldn't be able to, to micromanage everything that's happening. That's inter right. That's interesting. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, you know, talking about everything you're doing, um, Something I just yesterday I just spoke at a at this big uh, public high school to the seniors down in San Diego where I live and the big thing of course whether people are in are all ages but especially young people is fear and let me know uh, just give me a signal when you got to get going I know you got a lot going on so just give me a signal yeah get about five more minutes okay cool so this will be a a good last segue um. With everything that you that you released when you started with Confessions of an Economic Hitman, um, did was your people talk about how people that always uh, leak really in depth information, their life is threatened or things do happen? Has that happened to you? A lot of young people are scared about how people are going to think about them. Did you even get so far as the fear of of death? Mm, you know when I first started writing the book in the early 80s, I contacted other economic hitmen and jackals to get their stories in the book, and then I did get threatening phone calls. They threatened my life. And oh, I, wow. was, I, I, I was, yes, absolutely. I knew what they would do. They threatened my daughter's life, who was very, she was born in 1982, so she was very young. So they, that, that had a huge impression. That's why I didn't write the book. And, That's and that, why you stopped for a while, right? Right, So right. What, what made you have the strength to, to get beyond the fear of what could happen? Because we always think, what could happen if I do this? And then we don't do it. Yeah. So 9-11, uh, and I'm in the Amazon at 9-11. I, 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 although I didn't write the book, I wrote five other books on indigenous people. Right. And I was on the, in the Amazon 9-11, but then I went up to ground zero, and as I stood there, I knew I had to get this information out there. It was imperative. But this time, I decided not to tell a soul I was writing it. Didn't mm -hmm. contact anyone. And I get the whole manuscript written. I didn't write a proposal. I didn't get it in advance. I wrote the whole manuscript, got it in the hands of a very good agent who got it out to the publishing houses. At that point, it became my insurance policy. And even now, you know, I know that if somebody shot me today, it, the, my publishers would probably be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hopefully it, would sell, it would sell millions more copies of the books. <laughs> I'd become a martyr. And they know that, you know. So, so the, you know, if you're going to be a whistleblower, don't, don't threaten to blow the whistle. Get all your ducks yeah. in order. Get all your information someplace where it's safe. And, 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 and it's obvious that if, if something bad happens to you, all that information is going to just be blown sky high. And then, and then blow the whistle. You know, I think, I, I think Snowden was pretty smart to have made this announcement. Uh, and, you know, while well, he was in um, Hong Kong, and he's obviously being taken care of in Russia. I understand he's living quite well in Russia now. I don't know the fat, the details. Um, he, he, you know, the WikiLeaks guy uh, Assange was a little different. He he didn't play it quite so smart. So he's stuck in a broom closet in the Ecuadorian embassy in London now. But. <laughs> But, um, you know, it's it, so I, I think being a whistleblower and getting that information out is essential. I really encourage people to do it, be smart about doing it. But when it comes right down to the final analysis, uh, also, I think we've just got to have courage. You know, what can, they, what can they really do to you? You know, that's, I mean, all of our heroes throughout history, most everybody has heroes who took big risks and sometimes got punished for it. But we respect them for that, you know. Martin Luther King is a big hero to a lot of people. Jack Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, they, they died for their causes. You know, I wouldn't mind going in the way of one of them. I think that's Me not neither. a bad that's, Yeah, that's not a bad way to die, you know. It's a, it's, a lot, it's a lot better than suffering through cancer for two or three years or a stroke or, you know, whatever. MS or Parkinson's, you know, I'd much rather take a bullet for, for a really good cause and, and, and serve, a, serve notice on history that, that I'm now a martyr. 
and to quote to quote that Bill Hicks at the end when he says, "And those people come out and tell the world of these things, and then we kill those people." So yeah. if they if they kill you, then we can use the money, the millions that they'll sell in order to pay off college loan debts too. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I don't think the college loan debt should be paid <laughs> off. I'm just messing around. I agree yeah. with you. Let, I'm I'm going to make this video. Let, let the bankers pay the college loan debt. <laughs> No, I'm with you. And, you know, just to just to wrap this in full circle before you head out, you know, what I really got from what you said at the end there was you felt everyone has a different thing that they're sharing, whether it's just their talent in in an album or a book or a painting or or so far as blowing a whistle or going to um, going to help homeless people and we all feel fear about doing something that maybe is off the prescribed path of society and so for you it seemed to me that what you're saying is when you realize that you had something of value that it became an obligation that it was a sense of responsibility and obligation that you have to do this right right yeah absolutely no question about it cool John and and Jake, I would just like to say, I, I, you know, I don't know when we first got together. It was three years ago. Yeah, it was about four. Yeah, I drove like five hours to see you speak. <laughs> yeah, I you, I you impressed me a lot. You've matured so much in those four years. You know, you've really developed a style and 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 a great level of maturity and and eloquence that I deeply appreciate. And I just wanted to say that you're doing great stuff. So just keep it up and keep up that enthusiasm and passion. That's what changes the world. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. You know, as you know, it's super cool. You know, I, you really touch me into so to see the full circles neat. And I'm going to steal your idea and make that video to college kids. I'll shoot it your way. So thanks right. again, man. I, I really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing it. You're welcome. Thank All right, you. John. Bye-bye. Yeah, man, you rock. And uh, what's your godson? What's your grandson's name? John? Is it John or? Grant. Grant. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Tell Grant. <laughs> okay, will do. Right Bye-bye. on, brother. Thank you, John. You too. Do you want to reverse the facts that right now America is at the highest rate of clinical depression ever? Do you want to take happiness into the wind? Well, press subscribe, share, and then share a smile with the next person you see. Ready, ready, go, go, go!